Ms. Trexler Science Class. Today we're going to be learning about the Litter Design Challenge. So without further ado, let me go ahead and share with you where you can find this information on your laptop. So when you are here in your notebook, when you go to your content library and Litter Design Challenge is where you'll find all your information for the Litter Design Challenge. So what is a litter? Normally when our families are injured, we call 911 and an ambulance arrives and then we are able to get them help. But what if you're somewhere where the ambulance can't go? What if you're off road? So if you're hunting, maybe you're hiking or you're on the Hatfield McCoy trail, if you were to have an emergency and you needed to call 911 and you were far from the road, they would bring what is called an emergency rescue litter. So this is an example of an emergency rescue litter as well as this. Okay, so an emergency rescue litter's main importance is down here in our procedures. When we go to procedures, you cannot just carry an injured or hurt person directly out of the woods. Okay, uh, first we have to make sure that we can carry them, but we also have to make sure that we protect their spinal cord. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the spinal cord and how your spine works. If I'm looking at your spine here in this diagram, you can see that these pieces are bone and then these little pieces in between are something we call cartilage. Cartilage is really neat. You can find it in the tip of your nose. It's in your ears. It kind of feels like a bone, but it's not. It's bendable. Um, if you ever ate a chicken leg, it's at the very end of the chicken leg and kind of looks like a little piece of rubber. And the purpose of your cartilage is it allows bones to slide past one another. So if you've heard of someone who had like a knee replacement, they actually didn't have their knee replaced. They had the bones on their knees so that they could slide past each other recoded. Um, and then it helps so they're not grinding bone on bone. Your spine is kind of wiggly, right? And it allows you to bend forward, bend to the side. And those discs in between each one of those little bones is like a joint. So when you're looking here at your spine, at these little joints, each one, and like I said, is a joint. And then our spine is actually divided into five sections. We're only going to talk about the three um, that we deal with when we talk about a spinal injury that could come from a crash or a fall or something like that. So this is what your spine looks like from the outside. This little pattern here is actually supposed to be your spinal cord and it's hidden and protected in your spine. And if we scroll down here, I have a couple of pictures of a cross section of what your spine would look like. So this is the disc part, okay? We talked about that being cartilage. These are those little spiky pieces of bone. And inside that spiky piece of bone is an open area here where your spinal cord is hidden. So see, you can see here in the color picture as well, this is the spinal cord. And then this is um, an open area with fluid and fatty epidural tissue to kind of protect it and allow it to wiggle a little bit inside there. So if you were to take an injury to your spine, it's possible you could injure your nervous cord. And the important part about injuring your nervous cord is, or your nerve, yeah, your nerve cord is that, or your spinal nerve cord, is that if you injure it, um, that's how your brain communicates with the rest of your body. So um, let's say I put my hand on a hot stove, okay? Instantly, the nerve endings in my hand register out hot okay so they send that signal into my brain my brain interprets it and then it very quickly tells my hand to move okay so it talks to each muscle on the way down my arm and tells it to retract itself so that it doesn't continue to be burned um, but if your brain and your body can't communicate your brain has no control so if we go back and we look here at the spinal cord okay uh, if you take an injury, let's say to the lower section here in your lumbar section, this is gonna be, if you'll notice it's about where your bottom meets your back, um, about belly button section. There are five vertebrae in that section. And if you were to take an injury here and it were to injure the spinal cord, everything from the point of your injury down would get a type of paralysis. 
So there are two types of paralysis. We have total paralysis and partial paralysis. If someone is partially paralyzed, then that means they may have sensation, they may have feeling, um, or they may have some movement, but they don't have total control. If you are totally paralyzed, then that means you lose the ability to feel. So we said the nervous system has two main important things. It feels and interprets things and sends them to the brain, and then the brain tells us what to do. So um, a major issue with full paralysis, especially from the lumbar section up, is that those are where our internal, internal organs are. So if I take an injury to um, my lumbar section, then if that were to pinch or cause complete paralysis from that part of my nervous cord down, then I would lose feeling, sensation, and movement. So that little feeling you get when you're sitting in class and you're like, ooh, I gotta pee. Well, that comes from a sensation that your organ tell, feels, and then it tells your brain, and your brain says, okay, we gotta go find a bathroom. Um, but if you don't have that feeling, your nerve cords cannot communicate with your brain, then your body goes into what we call autopilot. So like a baby's body, um, as soon as you have that urge, or as soon as your bladder or colon are full, they just kind of release themselves. So you have no control over using the bathroom, you have no control over your legs, um, and no feeling. If we go back here to the spine and we talk some more about what happens as we further go up the spine, okay, the further up the spine you go, the more paralysis and less control and feeling you have. So because this nervous cord communicates with your whole entire body, Okay, if you were to take an injury in the upper thoracic section, then wherever that injury is from that point in the body down is where you would lose sensation if you were in full paralysis. Okay, um, partial paralysis again would happen from that point down. In your cervical area um, is the first place we see that we start to lose paralysis of all four limbs. If you have paralysis from the thoracic area down, we call that paraplegia, para meaning two, okay? So you have two limbs um, and plegia meaning paralysis. So you have two limbs that are paralyzed um, from the thoracic section down. If you get an injury to your cervical section, we call it quadriplegia or tetraplegia. Um, and those both those prefixes, quadra and tetra, meaning four. One is Greek and one is Latin. So four paralysis, meaning all four limbs are paralyzed. Depending on where you have this injury in your cervical section would depend upon whether or not you still have control of your neck or not. People who are quadriplegia or quadriplegic um, no longer are able to feed themselves. Uh, they're not able to control any of their internal organs. Um, so a lot of times uh, you'll notice that they're in a wheelchair um, and I can't think of his name right now. The scientist who used to move everything with his mouth. Um, why is his name leaving me? Steve. Okay, I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, but this area here is where we would get the quadra or tetraplegia. So when you are designing your literary or your litter design, your little rescue litter, um, there are a few constraints we need to make sure we understand. First is you do get a maximum of $20, okay? This is our materials list here for you, okay? So you get a maximum of $20 that you're allowed to spend. And then if I come further down um, into my constraints, it has to fit in the rescue backpack. Remember that the person who is injured is going to be far away from the road, at least half a mile or so, even if it's 500 feet, that still you can't go in a rocky territory with a normal stretcher. So your rescue backpack is going to be our Ziploc baggie. So your entire litter must fit in there so that you can hike to the destination. Um, time is going to be really important, how long it takes you to build your rescue litter will be important once you get to the victim. And stability is another really important goal that we have here so that we can tell how stable 
the back is going to be. Uh, it's going to be very important if your victim has received an injury that we make sure that we don't bend or further cause injury to their back. So that's going to be really important for us as well. When you design your litter, um, I don't want to actually cause serious or real injury to any human. So we're going to create our litter in a prototype form and we're going to create it to rescue a potato. OK, so your potato will be your mock human. Now, your potato has to have its spine protected and sturdy. But at the same time, if we put the potato in a rescue litter um, that's too sturdy and doesn't have any cushion, then we could also run into a time where we might cause more injury as well. So please be sure to watch the videos I've posted in Schoology on your rescue litter so that you can see a couple of them actually in training videos being used. And if you have any more questions, please feel free to email me or send me a message in Schoology. Have a great day, guys.